we work at the Sun and teach education. Um, and very recently, some changes are put that uh, some mobilise people. Um, and then just have a particular look at teacher education in particular, and then um, try, uh, while there are contradictions and tensions in the Harrison law side, I'll try and finish with something that's a little bit more positive. We don't want to depress ourselves too much, do we? So in terms of the regulatory framework that we work within, we have a thing called the New Zealand Teachers Council. And this particular body uh, essentially says of itself, oh, I'm sorry, it's a bit um, fuzzy, that it's about um, the professional and regulatory framework that we work in. But most of it's work is the kind of accountability and auditing process. So uh, at, for teachers and schools, they have to have a police check, they have to um, have a go through a teacher education program, which then gives them two years of provisional registration. And while they're in their schools for the first few years, they undergo a program of development, and then at the end of the few years, they are assessed to be fit to be fully registered teachers. And from that point, teachers have to be registered for three years and prove their school satisfactory, while if yearly within the school have an appraisal process themselves. But when we look at teacher education programs, which is where I put up, um, the, the Teachers' Council audits programs on a regular basis, and these are the things that every program has to cover. So it's quite no mean feat to set up a teacher education program. And given that this is a conference centred on looking at um, information communication technology, um, I'm going to kind of pick out one little tiny bit about the way it frames aspects of teacher education and what that one detail actually um, says. But first of all, one of the other things that um, has to, that's worthwhile looking at, is the, the good character notion. And um, so there are certain ethical standards that we are expected to uphold and they become part of the um, uh, employment contracts that we work with them, and that are part of the also the union um, contract stuff as well. Um, so if we look at the singular detail about information technology competency, there are two particular things about this. That um, what it tells the uh, initial teacher education provider, that's what the ITE means, um, it says it has to occur as about a kind of a computer um, certificate in a sense. Which and then as an article adds something about pedagogy. So I actually think you've got it the wrong way around. That um, that the whole framework for what it means to be a teacher undersells the role that these technologies can play in purposeful learning. And I, and I suspect that it was this whole frame of what these programs have to produce was framed by those who kind of don't get the power of these tools in education. So there are some really um, unintended consequences of all of these things. Now that image was one that I took, in fact, on campus at Waikato, um, outside a lecture theatre. I suspect it was put up there when they were having an exam from there, but I, I think it says quite a lot about how these tools are positioned in education in lots of places. Because it's not an uncontested field, as we all know. Um, and you're feeling the love right now, aren't you? Um, so what it means in schools is because of some of those um, requirements are so awfully um, it, was, it ends up with really idiosyncratic um, um, environments in schools because we in New Zealand were the architects of self-managing schools, which means that schools can actually organise themselves according to their own um, frameworks and what they consider to be important. 
So it means that most of the schools um, look the same, feel the same. I mean, that's my bad thing. But also the kinds of provisions that are considered to be core are also not the same. So when our students go out and practice um, they're not necessarily going to go into a school that is very well provisioned for these kinds of things. And they may, they may be working with teachers who actively um, operate to prevent the incursion of these tools into their classroom spaces. Um, and even within a single school, there can be one department saying, yes, bring your own device, while another one says, say, if I see it, I'll confiscate it. So it's very wide and um, quite difficult for them to navigate sometimes. So, you know, does this mean that these, these kinds of tools are part of what it means to learn as social beings uh, and to bring from home the social practices that are very um, intimately connected with many of our students? And so what's the level of recreation or agency that either any student going from an initial teacher education space to a school on practicum is able to exert and or how does that operate in school? And these are not questions I'm necessarily going to deal with today, but they are very thought and um, important ones for how, how these students can negotiate their own space once they leave initial teacher education. Now we have changes afoot as well, and we can thank you for these. No. At the last election, <laughs> um, there was some horse traders <coughs> among minority um, parties, and a particular horse trading incident between the National Party and ACT, which has one member of parliament. Um, suddenly, by deciding that they were going to work together, they decided they were going to have these things called partnership schools, which in any other constitution or jurisdiction are called charter schools. But what scares us about this is that the premises upon which these schools are being introduced is that these schools can be run by anybody. They will get government money but are not accountable to the public. That the Official Information Act will not apply, so we're not going to be able to get any information from them. And that they don't have to employ proper teachers. So, Extraordinary, never heard of such a thing. <laughs> so what, what is happening is a dismantling the attendance of dismantling of things that have worked incredibly well for us. And I would say that given the propensity of, um, of rights from governments to want to emasculate unions, and our teacher unions are actually quite strong, that this is one way of doing that. And by having, long, uh, by having people in these kinds of schools that aren't teachers, they don't have to follow the same kind of procedures of registration that the rest of us do. In other schools, are probably going to want to follow suit because it's going to be easy to manipulate them and to use them as cheap labour. Um, and also, it makes it much, much easier for commercial, um, for, for commerce to get a foot in the door and play things their way. That's the cynic in me. I'm sure I'm wrong. On the other hand, we have a very recent report to government, to Parliament, from the Education and Science Committee that asked for uh, submissions to inform a report on 21st century learning. And this is actually available really um, easily. Uh, you've got 21st century plus New Zealand Parliament and um, report. You might be able to find it and I can show you at the end of this how to find, find that particular report. This report was cross party, was it this, the Education Science Committee working on this report cross party. Uh, it was led by the Associate Minister for Education, Matthew Kay, who is deeply interested in, in digital stuff. 
in schools and is actually quite forward thinking report. And I just picked out a few of the recommendations from that report. I think there are actually a hundred in total. And if you look at some of the things that it suggests, one of which is looking at um, actually understanding what's going on in early childhood with digital technology, for instance. And that government should introduce policies <coughs> that provide access for all students to, to use these tools. Um, and then we have all of these other things where, where if a charter school, I should call it partnership school, I'm sorry. That's the, like, that's the term that's supposed to make us believe that they're not charter schools. Um, means that these schools could not do this, wouldn't have to use any technological tools, um, or choose to do it in a particular way using one, only one commercial product, perhaps. Um, so we've got on the one hand some very broad, far-reaching possibilities for the government to consider, for the Ministry of Education to consider. Um, and yet, when we look at the requirements of the National Future Education Provision and the graduating teacher standards set up by the um, Teachers' Council, standard four really only requires teachers to be able to demonstrate proficiency in using ICT relevant to their role. So again, it, it doesn't have any teeth to suggest that all teachers should be um, finding ways to make learning as accessible as possible for their students um, and using whatever tools will help them do that. And if um, these digital tools can do that, then that's what they should be using. The other thing that's happening is the rollout of ultra-fast board broadband, commonly referred to as the UFP, um, to sort by the end of 2016. And that means that most schools will have really strong connectivity, and many now are positioning themselves to take advantage of that kind of um, Wi-Fi uh, access. Um, and that means that a number of us um, in the faculty are actually engaging with schools in researching their use of, of mobile technologies. So I just had to have something up appeared earlier that you might want to have a look at. Um, that just that just outlines some really small things that have really just started in the last two years, and we can only see them happening uh, even more broadly. So this isn't going to go away. And, and I think the, 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 the territory that we're looking at is what do, we, what do we do to make these things as valuable as possible for all the right reasons? Not because someone says, oh, the school down the road is using these things, we should have them too. It's got to be purposeful, it's got to, got to be really based on something that is really meaningful for both learners and teachers. What's happening too nationally is that um, we have um, provided nationally the opportunity for schools to use these portfolios. Um, the, we have a digital repository, a national digital repository, and we have the talent scheme, which is shorthand for the laptops for teachers program. And I'll talk about each of those briefly. So, for instance, the Ministry of Education has, for the last two or three years, fully funded schools' access to a, uh, a, a dedicated version of Mahara for schools. And we, as initial teacher education institutions, can use them too. And there are hundreds of schools using this particular version. It's called eportfolio.school.nz. Uh, and it it's, um, provides a platform for both teachers to use it, for kids to use it, for them to use it together, and for schools to use it for teachers' appraisal, for developing a, a portfolio of practice, 
Um, and it's been used quite a lot by institutions like ours to support our initial teacher education students to develop a strong CV um, and use it as part of their um, uh, assessments for us while they're in, in initial teacher education and use those pages to demonstrate their knowledge of pedagogy, their knowledge of curriculum, and their knowledge of using digital tools uh, in a really purposeful way and the ability to demonstrate their critical thinking about their own progress as teachers. Um, so it's used very widely and the developers behind it are always responding to requests about this is what we want to do, can you help us make it happen? So there's a lot of uh, flexibility happening there. The other one that's uh, really important is um, TKI, which is the uh, which is Tikiti Bikurani, which means the baskets of knowledge, and it's a site for for teachers and students, but particularly for teachers. And this particular version, this particular page, is the um, portal for the Digi Store, which contains a whole lot of resources um, for teachers based on curriculum things of the community for teachers to um, talk to each other on it and it just keeps on growing. It's actually a very, very fine thing. I'm not sure how accessible it will be for you, but you could probably at least poke around on the front page um, and have a have a look at what it might tantalise you with. The other thing then is looking at, okay, so what about the digital space in teaching education? There are, um, I grabbed these two quotes from um, these two, from Montes and Yang. They're from two kind of different periods. And, and when we're talking about the digital space, we know that it changes so fast that five years is really ancient history. So, and yet there's a lot of similarities between the two that teachers' beliefs and, and in fact their dispositions are actually central to whether or not things will happen within a school, both uh, across departments and, and for all students. And then the whole notion of the, the integration from, from policy right down to practice, that whole conduit has to work together. So when you're faced with the contradictions and tensions of the one hand not talking to the other hand in, in policy development, things get very difficult when you're in the middle. Um, there, there are a couple of other things that have um, started to become really, really interesting. There's an article I wrote on Twitter in 2010 in, in, uh, in which I got students to volunteer, but they I asked myself, like, what well, it sounds like an amazing policy. Um, while they're on practicum, to tweet three times a day, answering one or five questions. Like, what am I learning? What are my students doing? Um, what's getting in the way? Um, what do I think should be happening? Those kinds of things. And um, across all of them, they initially said things like, uh, don't like 140 characters because they want to say too much. But within a couple of weeks, they were saying, actually, 140 characters isn't that bad because it makes me really think about what I'm doing before I do it, before I say anything. And it's really cool to connect with other people, even though I've got the door shut, because I don't feel alone anymore. Um, and so there were some really strong, effective um, responses from them and also the sense of community that they built up. And then the following year when I tried it again, uh, one of the things I found out was that quite a long time afterwards, that one of the students was on track with a, a group of other, there must have been 10 of them in the same school, and they knew that he was a good volunteer for this. So at lunchtime they would say, well, I'm going to tweet today, which would initiate a discussion about pedagogy, which I thought was really cool. So it's those little serendipitous things that you never really know about at the time that actually help affirm how valuable some of these tools are if we just stop them and have a go. Another thing that um, is quite useful um, 
has been the, the e-learning literature review, and I'm sorry, it's kind of me again, but um, the ministry contracted me to write this review, and they said we want you to look at uh, e-learning um, and e-learning outcomes for students in New Zealand schools, and I said, Ask them initially what you mean by outcomes, because if you're looking at the, um, a direct causal relationship between using a digital tool in the classroom and students' uh, achievement, it's going to be a really, really short literature review, because a causal relationship is a very cool twin um, in education. And so that leads to examining what outcomes mean in a whole lot of different contexts for this. And that, uh, that particular review has actually got, had quite a lot of traction. So um, it, might, it might be useful for you as well. Um, the URL is there if, if you wanted to follow that up. And that's really accessible. It's on the site for Education Accounts, which is run by the Ministry of Education, where they publish all of the research reports they commission in all the different fields. Um, and uh, quite a useful thing to use. So let me get on to some contradictions and tensions. We've actually got a number of things. Is, it, we, is, is teaching and learning really about curriculum knowledge? Is it about pedagogical knowledge? And, or is it about technological knowledge? And are all the things, are those three things supposed to be an either or? Because often they are positioned as that. If we do this, then, you know, we're throwing the baby out to the bathwater. It's a bit like Bob this morning talking about, well, how will break loose if we change a slate into something else, or if we now allow students to use 4.10? You know, the world will fall down. Um, education will completely be unrecognisable. And it's the same kind of um, reaction people have when. Um, enthusiasts would like to try using newer tools, like digital ones. And of course, when you have things like the TPAC framework, the Mishra and Kola, one where, where unless the technological knowledge is built for teachers within their own practice, um, around their own practice, and experimenting with their own practice, and examining what happens with their own students, then it's only ever going to be a periphery. And we're only ever going to get that dichotomy that that cartoon says exists. And, um, and even though it's a highly gendered one as well, um, it still encapsulates the, the, the difficulties when, when what, creepy wheels have far too much to say. The, one of the things I keep hearing at home is, Oh, you know, we can't allow students to have their own uh, digital tools because what about the kids who don't have them? I would say, so what happens in schools when we know that the kids don't buy the books that you want them to read? What do you do? You have a library. You have you loan things. There is always a solution rather than having to be stuck by the problem. And I think this comes back to teacher, teacher dispositions. What do they think matters? How do we help them see beyond the here and now? And how do we help them really, really focus on what it means for, for students? And where do political ideologies get in the way of being able to do a good job? Um, so essentially, Political interference can be a help and a hindrance. You know, as I've shown you, we've got some of the things that the Ministry of Education support, the e-portfolios, the DigiStore, the um, Teller Laptops project for teachers, which is a line of things. Schools buy into it. When every three years, the um, devices are updated, um, and teachers can um, hire to buy. So it's a very, very cost-effective um, process. And that has also helped develop greater proficiency among teachers. So I'd just like to end on a, on a high note and a bit of, and a bit of flight for our own context, because 
these are the kinds of things that our university is attempting to focus on that we've got um, a really strong focus about wanting to grab the digital space. We run an e-learning day each year for, for schools. We um, collaborate with the New Zealand version of CORE and we've just begun a collaboration with NetSafe, which is the body also supported by the Ministry of Education to focus on cyber safety. And the, the Associate Minister for Education just recently launched NetSafe's first graphic novel, graphic comic about cyber safety for primary schools. Now, I don't think this would actually pass a gender or violence analysis, which is, but that's still pretty cool for those things to happen. Um, and we've been here as part of the whole developing those international links. So I'll stop there because we've kind of run out of time, but I hope there's some time for questions or comments. Thank you. 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 Thank you.